that touch us in special ways in our everyday lives. For me, uh, it's the arts, it's literature, it's history. The humanities are learning experiences that teach us a lot about who we are, where we came from, and hopefully where we're going. And how does the Pennsylvania Humanities Council promote the humanities? Through programming. Uh, we have some absolutely wonderful programs that um, are far-reaching across the entire state. I'd love to tell you just a little bit about them. One of my personal favorites uh, are the Commonwealth Speakers, who really visit every county in Pennsylvania, telling stories, uh, small performances. Uh, another absolute favorite is Read All About It. And this um, is through the library system. It encourages not only reading, but discussing what you've read. Another great program that we offer is a grants program. We offer uh, grants to local organizations to support their programs and also to assist in bringing our programs into the area. How often do you have these events? We are part of partnerships within the community, uh, weekly, monthly, seasonal. It, it depends. Check our calendar. It's listed at www.pahumanities.org on the web. I'm sure you'll find something you like. Thanks so much, Ann and Brian. You know, the humanities really are the key that unlocks the door to the things that we're passionate about, like our history and our identity. Let's go back now for more from Congressman Stevens. I was discussing the Emancipation Proclamation, my work on the 13th Amendment. Well, I must tell you, that even after amending the Constitution of the United States, not once but twice, I always said my proudest accomplishment came right here in Pennsylvania, right here in Harrisburg, 175 years ago, in fact, in April of 1835, the day I helped save public education in Pennsylvania. Now, we discussed, discussed earlier the state constitution of 1790 that was a bit ambiguous about voting rights. Well, it also had another failing. At the convention in 1790, some of the delegates wanted to establish free schools, schools for everyone, not just those who could afford private tuition. Others believed that if they wrote in free schools and the school taxes to pay for them, the Constitution might never pass. And so in the end, they wrote into that Constitution these words instead. The legislature shall, as soon as conveniently may be, provide for the establishment of schools. The state legislature did not think it was convenient. If they created public schools and school taxes, they might lose their seats. And so they did nothing for the next 18 years. Finally, in 1809, they passed a law to create, no, not public schools, created tuition assistance, what I believe you call vouchers in your day. If you wanted to have your child educated and could not afford private tuition, you could apply for help from the state. But you would have to apply for the help. You would have to certify to your county commissioners that you were a pauper. And then you would have to go to a public meeting and testify in front of all of your neighbors that you could not afford to pay for the education of your own children. And then the teacher would keep a record every day of the names and attendance and expenses incurred for each poor student. Well, that law remained the law of the land for the next quarter century. There was an effort to reform things in the 1820s, but it failed. But then, then came the good people of Pennsylvania, people like yourselves, who wrote letters to their legislators and talked to their neighbors and sent speakers from town to town, spreading the word that education was the birthright of every Pennsylvanian. In 1830, Pennsylvania elected a pro-schools man, George Wolfe, to be governor of the Commonwealth. In 1834, my first year, my first term in the state legislature, we passed the school law. It said that every township and borough in Pennsylvania would become its own school district. The residents would vote each year whether to accept state help to create publicly funded schools or continue under that law of 1809 without the state funding. Now, it was quite a battle to get that law passed, but in the end it did pass with only one dissenting vote in the House and three in the Senate. It was signed into law in April 1834 may seem difficult to believe, but there were those at the time who objected, who said that schools were too expensive, school taxes too high, school teachers too highly paid. Ridiculous, I know, hard to believe. Well, that fall, a whole new slate of state legislators were, ex 
were elected, whose platforms had one plank in common, repeal the school law, end public education in Pennsylvania. The next spring, the state Senate voted to do just that. The state house seemed about to do the same. I could not stand by and let it happen. I've told you, I, I grew up on a poor farm in Vermont. I could not have amounted to very much in the larger scheme of things without an education. But education changed my life, gave me a chance. By 1835, I was a college graduate, a lawyer, a trustee at the Gettysburg Academy, a founding trustee at the college in Gettysburg, a member of the school board in Gettysburg as well. And I believed that education should belong to everyone, not just a fortunate few. And so I stood up to object. I said, there are those who hold that education is a private duty, not a public one, who are willing to educate their own children, but not other people's children. But if our republic is to endure, every citizen must be prepared to direct wisely the legislature, the ambassador, the executive of a nation. For some part of all of these things falls to every voter. And so it is the duty of the government to see to the education of every free man. Others propose a return to the law of 1809. Assessors shall take a census and make a public record of the poor. And the teacher then shall keep a record of the names and attendance of poor scholars, thus pointing out their poverty in the midst of their fellows. Such a law should be called an act for branding and mocking the poor, that they may be known from the rich and proud. Still others oppose the school tax, because it is for the benefit of others and not themselves. But it is for our benefit, inasmuch as it perpetuates the government under which we live and by which our lives and property are protected. Sir, you may endow college after college. They will never be filled or filled only with students from other states. Free schools plant the seed and desire of knowledge in every mind. And wherever that seed falls on fertile soil, it springs forth in glorious fruit. Earthly glory is there equal to that conferred by education. My friends, build not your monuments out of marble and brass, but make them of ever living mind. It is not so expensive. And what if it were? Why do you cling so tightly to your gold? Let us learn to dread ignorance more than taxation. Let us look to the future and so cast our votes that the blessings of education shall be conferred on every child of Pennsylvania, shall be carried home to the poorest child of the poorest inhabitant of the meanest hut of your mountains, so that even he may be prepared to act well his part in this land of free men. I spoke for two hours that day. I will not inflict that on you. Even my opponents said they had never heard such passion and eloquence in those halls. When it was done, the state house voted to keep the school law. After all, the state senate reversed course and did the same. Free, public, universal education in Pennsylvania would go on. I went on as well. I went on working for education, went on working for freedom. And for many people, those two causes would have been more than enough. William Lloyd Garrison, for instance, the firebrand of the abolitionist cause, closed down his newspaper, The Liberator. Once we passed the 13th Amendment, the work was done. But as far as I was concerned, freedom and education were part of a larger story, the story of freedom, of rights, of fair play. So I continued my work. Now, I've given you a great deal to, to keep track of, so let me give you one image to keep it all crystal clear. In January of 1862, word came to us in Congress that the Union was turning away fugitives from the battlefield. Men and women and children would escape from slavery and make their way to the front lines, and our own troops would take them back to their plantations. It seemed wrong to me. I spoke out in Congress. I said that it was as if we had given our generals a sword in one hand and manacles in the other. Far better, I said to give them a sword in one hand and the book of freedom in the other. Well, one year later, a corporal from Massachusetts wrote home in a letter that was printed and reprinted and reprinted again throughout the abolitionist press. He wrote describing 
how his, his men, his unit, had freed a community from slavery and armed the men as new recruits. And he wrote, describing those black recruits there at the battlements with a musket in one hand and a spelling book in the other. Freedom and equality and education all rolled into one. United States colored troops were a dream come true for me. And I worked and worked and worked to get them equal pay, fair treatment. It's a hard, <laughs> a hard challenge to, to master. Now I worked throughout my life for freedom, equality, education. When the school board in Gettysburg refused to accept black students, I helped to create a new school just for our black residents. You've heard, no doubt, of my housekeeper, my estate manager, the chief of my staff, Mrs. Lydia Hamilton Smith, who I treated as an equal throughout more than 20 years, scandalized many of my friends and many more of my enemies. Well, I'm sure some of you have heard, but I will tell you this, when the end of the war came, and there was a grand review in Washington, D.C., and the United States colored troops were not invited to participate. I am proud to say that it was this city of Harrisburg, this brand new city at the time, alone out of the entire nation that stood up and hosted its own review for those colored troops. Much as it galls me to say anything nice about the man, Simon Cameron received them, thanked them, congratulated them. I was too ill to attend myself, but I sent a letter of, of support. Now, after the war, it became clear that the work was not done. I continued working in the Congress. I served on the committee that wrote the 14th Amendment, guaranteeing equality under the law. I was pushing for what became the 15th Amendment, the right to vote. Well, my life came to an end. I spent the last few years of my life battling with President Johnson to keep Reconstruction on track to make sure that real change would take place and that we would not be heading right back to another civil war just a few years later. In the very last days of my life, I was working to bring public education to Washington, D.C. Now in August of 1868, I left this earth. But I like to think that in my last act, I stood up for what I believed one final time. I chose to be buried, as you heard, in an obscure little cemetery in Lancaster belonging to Martin Schreiber. Why? Because it was the one cemetery in town that was not segregated by race. 20,000 people came to my funeral, half of them, half of them black, including a number of USCT soldiers. And in my, in my will, I left the bulk of my estate to create a school, today the Thaddeus Stevens College of Technology with two rules. Number one, the school must be open and accept all sorts of people, regardless of race or color or creed, it must be open to everyone. And number two, the students must all be fed at the same table. My belief was that if the students came together and ate together and spoke together and shared their stories, that perhaps they might start breaking down some of their differences. So I do want to thank all of you for coming to share my story and all of you at home as well. Very strange technology. <laughs> I thank you for your kind attention this evening. Well, Thaddeus Stevens was certainly a colorful and compelling historical character, and it was a privilege to have him with us on the program. Fortunately, we have been able to persuade a gentleman who bears a remarkable resemblance to the congressman to spend some time with us and talking about bringing history to life. Steve Anderson is with us now. And Steve, tell us how it is that you came to play the part of Thaddeus Stevens. Thank you, and thank all of you for, for coming and bearing with me. Well. As you said at the, the beginning, I, I'm an actor with 20 years of acting experience, 10 years of interactive theater. Back in the very, very beginning of 2007, I heard that they were having auditions for a troupe of, of living history interpreters who 